Good evening, everyone. Hello. Welcome to a special Science on Tap. We are here this evening to watch a recording of an event that we did on uh, in June of 2017 with one of our very favorite authors, Mary Roach, talking about her book, uh, Grunt, The Curious Science of Humans at War. And this was a super fun event, just about the most fun I've had on stage ever um, getting to sit and talk with her and hey remember live in-person events um yeah this is this is kind of a fun memory of that and hopefully a uh idea of what is to come soon so just a couple quick things about um, what to expect this evening and who we are if you're tuning in for the first time um, science on tap here's a picture actually from that event uh, science on tap is a uh, science lecture series based here in portland oregon and our goal is to make science fun and compelling for adults um, in particular and you know we welcome kids to come too but it's really important obviously for adults to know and believe in and understand science so we're all glad you're here to learn about that just a quick thank you to our, I believe that we're at 124 uh, Patreon supporters donating $10 or more a month. Thank you, thank you. Um, we would not still be around if you folks weren't supporting us. And um, all of you folks who have uh, donated money for tickets for tonight, thank you very much. Um, thank, we, we really appreciate your support. And also just a quick plug, we are hoping very much so to get back to live in theater events. And we recognize that there's a bunch of people who are not in the Portland area. I think I saw Louisiana and, and Idaho and, and whatnot in the chat. Um, and what we want to do is do live events and also stream them at the same time. And that takes some extra equipment and, and knowledge that we don't have yet. And so we are doing a special fundraising campaign to try and raise money specifically so that we can do live uh, in person and online events. So if you think that that would be compelling, if you are outside of Portland, for example, um, or in Portland and, and don't want to drive and worry about parking, um, please, we encourage you, uh, if you want to take a look at our uh, funding campaign, we would be super grateful. Okay, so with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and welcome you all to get back in the Wayback Machine and go to the summer of 2017 at the Alberta Rose Theater here in Portland. And have a good time. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Everyone say hi, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Wow, that was very energetic of you. Thank you. <laughs> For those of you who don't already know me, my name is Amanda Thomas, and I am your mistress of ceremonies this evening, and I'd love to welcome you to Science on Tap. Yay! As you know, we are here to talk to the fabulous Mary Roach about Grunt, the Curious Science of Humans at War. And we're going to do it a little bit differently this evening. You see the chairs. She and I are going to sit up here and we're going to have a little conversation, some interview questions. And then we will have uh, a microphone out in the audience to take questions from you folks towards the end. So hang on to your questions. We'll get to them uh, at the end and we'll all have a good time. So question for you. How many of you have read one of Mary's books? Okay. Most of you. Fantastic. How many of you have read this book? Fewer, but still quite a lot. Well, if you haven't read any of Mary's books, you are about to meet your new favorite science writer. Uh, she has written books on sex, death, space travel, your gut, and now the military. And, but it's not the military of how to shoot people. I think she mentions one gun, basically, which is a chicken gun that they use to test airplanes for bird strike issues. Um, but she's more talking about things like, quote, extreme heat, cataclysmic noise, and ill-timed gastrointestinal urgency. <laughs> so, for example, if you're on special ops and you get diarrhea, how, how do you handle that? Some very interesting stories about that. <laughs> she also has found out uh, what the insurance code, uh, the billing code for maggots is. Uh, so if you want to have that maggots debride your, your wound, how you would charge for that. 
um, how to develop a fabric that is cool, won't melt, but yet will keep a crease, and all about reconstructive surgery for soldiers who have had their penises shot off. And all you men are just like, eh, yeah. <laughs> So we're going to talk about a lot of those things. Again, I uh, will have here, up here, we'll ask some questions, then we'll have some time for you. So with that, let's welcome Mary Roach to the stage. Oh my God. We have a full house tonight, if that's not obvious. So that's, I'm so excited. You're Hello. here. Yay. <laughs> so oh, I'm sure you get this. We have a timer. This is like Mission Impossible. Totally like, is. Yeah. Tom like Cruise is going to be uh -huh. lowering, lowering in here. Yeah. No, <laughs> not really. Um, so I'm going to start with the question that I'm sure everybody asks you, and you're probably tired of answering, but these people haven't heard your answer. Um, how do you come up with your book ideas? And how do you know when you have found the right stories or the right topic? Sure. Uh, it happens in different ways. Um, the best one was for Bonk, which had to do with the study of sexual physiology. And that happened, I was flipping through film quarterly. I don't know why, I don't subscribe, but uh, and there was a reference to the colposcopic films of Masters and Johnson, and I thought, colposcopy, cervical biopsy film, seems like they were filming inside a woman's body while she was sexually responding. Sex research will be the next book. It was this <laughs> moment. Uh, and that is, in fact, what it was. They had sort of a penis camera, and uh, that's what they were doing. So that's easy. That was a boom, new book. Um, Hacking for Mars, is a, it was a case of um, many, many, many years ago, I was working on a, um, a story for Vogue magazine about osteoporosis, and I got a little bored with the topic, and I thought, how can I liven this up? I called an astronaut, because NASA worries about bone loss. And the conversation strayed, and he told me about the, the, this, um, how they train astronauts to kind of dock with the toilet in space, because you... <laughs> You don't really sit, you know, you kind of like have, and it's a small hole, and it's airflow, and if you get your angle wrong, it's really bad. Anyway, so he told me this, <laughs> he told me this, that, that they train them on this, it's a toilet in, at Johnson Space Center with a video camera pointing up and a closed circuit feed on the side that is showing you um, a unique view of your anatomy uh, that, as you've never seen it. Uh, and, but I couldn't work this into a Vogue story. <laughs> Try as I may. Um, but I've stored it in the back of my head and I'm like, one day I will write about that video toilet. And it stayed in the back of my head and it was kind of like, I tell people, it's like that, that there's this horrible ad for Kohler faucets where a couple goes to an architect and they sit down and they put a faucet on the table and they say, build a house around this. And I, so I kind of like built a book around the toilet. <laughs> and you find a few more toilets and you throw a cover on it. I mean, you know, a few more faucets, whatever. And then it's a book. So that sometimes happens. And <laughs> like you um, do. And grunt happened because I was in India reporting on the world's hottest chili pepper and the uh, uh, chili pepper eating contest crazy situation. Somebody said this pepper, the Indian Defense Ministry made an, ex a, a, they weaponized this pepper. They made kind of like a, a bomb, an exploding hot chili pepper bomb, s sort of like pepper spray, but locally sustainably grown. And, um, <laughs> and I thought that well here in Portland. <laughs> yes, right. And I, so I, I think I got to go to that lab. And so at the lab, they were doing that and they were, there was some guys working on a leech repellent, which I thought was awesome. I was just going down to the river and rolling up their trousers and testing um, this leech repellent. And that gave me this idea that military science was kind of an interesting esoteric world to step into. And that's always what I'm looking for. Just some world to go play around in and geek out in. And that's what I did and do. And that's how I, 
That was a really long answer. It's fine with me. That's yeah. about it for tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so toilets. Uh, <laughs> yes. You often end up talking about somewhat taboo topics like toilets or in uh, Gulp, some of the things that you were talking about yes. in that book and, and obviously Bonk. Is that... Are you seeing a, a market niche there and just deciding, <laughs> like, hey, there's not a book about this? Um, or, or what, what yeah. why? Yeah. Um, yes, my first book, I, I, for, I, I was a magazine writer for, for 15 years or so, and I, and I never ever came across something that screamed, write a book about me. And I, I really wanted to write a book, but I had this sense that everything was kind of done. I'm, and so I'm, and I have become sort of the bottom feeder of nonfiction. <laughs> I'm kind of like, yeah, shit and toilets and yeah, I'll, I'll take that, I'll do that, I'll do that. Just let me, just let me do that. Uh, and, and to me it's fun. Um, I like to mess around with things that are a little taboo because uh, I, I, my goal is not, believe it or not, to gross people out. My goal is, I, lo I love for people to, to come to my books thinking, hmm, yeah, I, I don't know, I, th hmm, I, I, th I, thought, this, I thought this was going to be really gross, and it is, but it's also, it's really interesting, and sometimes important, because I think sometimes the fact that something is off-putting, repulsive, or gross, uh, it doesn't get the attention that it should, and it's, it's kind of taboo, and it's not spoken about, like anal cancer, I remember in Gulp talking about uh, the, it doesn't even have its own ribbon, its own colored rib ribbon. <laughs> it's like nobody wants to go there. It should be a little asterisk ribbon, right? <laughs> yes! Exactly. Exactly. They, um, you have to know that the, um, the, the colon cancer people had brown, and they, they so they're like, no. No, we don't want to, we want to be blue. No. Don't make us be brown. So speaking of anuses, um, <laughs> one of the things that I find really charming about your books is that you often put yourself on the line in, in your research for the books. So for those of you who read uh, Packing for Mars, there was the pee drinking, um, re, re, per, not repurposed, what's uh, recycled, um, recycled, uh, recycled, filtered, yes. filtered yeah. recycled, reverse yeah. osmosis, right. yes, treated, yes. let's say treated, treated, Del pee. let's say delicious, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it was mine, my, my pee, yeah, I don't just drink anybody's pee. <laughs> Or n not without some incentive. <laughs> Prior consent, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, <laughs> go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and then in Bonk, there was the infamous ultrasound scene where for those yes. of you for those of you who haven't read bonk actually why don't why don't we have you describe it oh yeah well okay um <laughs> yeah so for bonk uh one of the things i wanted to get at was the uh delightful awkwardness of of, of being a couple going into a laboratory and doing sexual things which masters and johnson in the 50s had people do and i would love love to speak to those people who participated in the 50s but they were all anonymous and there's identities uh, very uh, assiduously guarded. So I looked around and it was, you know, it's, if you're gonna do a, a sexual physiology study, you, do, you usually don't need a couple. You need, you know, a finger, <laughs> like a hand, a vibrator. You don't need two people. But I wanted to include a two-person study because I wanted to, you know, capture that Masters and Johnson thing. Anyway, I found this guy in London who is doing an ultrasound it's a, it was an imaging technique, like a four-dimensional movie ultra, in ultrasound, uh, and which is kind of like if you're, pre, you could preview something you're gonna operate on surgically, or anyway, so it's, it's a diagnostic technique, and he wanted to document, having documented erections, um, his own, 
he said, he announced in this paper about the erections that the next thing he would try to be documenting was um, two people in sexual congress. And I wrote to him and said, I really would like to, uh, I'd like to be there for this historic undertaking. <laughs> and he wrote back and said, um, I, I, that would be fine, um, except that we are having some trouble uh, finding a couple for intimate study. So if your organization can provide one, I'll be happy to arrange this. So my husband, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, my organization called its husband. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, that was certainly awkward. Yeah, we were on the uh, yeah on the line. Is that what you said? Yeah, and we were. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, I do that. And that was. <laughs> and it's fine for me because I'm going to have the fun of writing it. I was taking notes during the whole thing. <laughs> Um, but my poor husband, because the, the burden of performance was on him, obviously. <laughs> and uh, you know, he made the mistake early on of saying, your book is about sex research, sign me up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I did. But um, you're wondering, why do I do this? Why do I put myself through this? Because uh, it's... Although awkward, um, it's just, it's really fun to write it for me, and it's I, hopefully fun for people to read it, and uh, it makes a good story for book tour. <laughs> yeah. So specifically in Grunt, the, uh, the experiment you participated in, or one of the experiments that you participated in, was very, also very personal. Uh -huh. And with regards to sweat and water loss and all of oh, that. Oh, in the cookbox. Yes. Yeah, the heat Can stroke you... chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're talking about the the probe? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, the probe. But the probe was, f all right, if you're going to measure somebody's core temperature, you do it up the butt. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know going into that that, that this was going to be the situation. What's funny about the, the probe is that it's attached to, it's like the, it, as big, heavy as a laptop computer, like it's like a brick, and you forget that it's in there, and you're standing talking to somebody, and the unit is on the counter, and then you go to walk away, <laughs> <laughs> and something really bad happens. <laughs> uh, so that was actually the, wor the worst of it. It was just, oh, I'm, I'm really, I think I broke the probe, and... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, but, uh, that was just part of the study. <laughs> I had to do it. It wasn't my idea. So that brings me to the, the idea of, of your process. Obviously, there are some things that you um, get personally involved in, but, but how do you figure out what you're going to write? How do you, how long does it take you to write a book? Yeah. What, what's your process? Um, it begins with sort of six months of random flailing, and I like just, because I don't know really anything about a topic when I start, and foolishly, when I begin a new book, it's a completely different topic, and I don't make use of the sources or information that I learned I, in the last one. I'm like, ah, I'm done with that. So I move on, and I need to uh, just sort of get the lay of the land, and a lot of just poking around, calling people up, uh, thinking, oh, I'm gonna write about these seven things, and then they don't work out, or I'd find something better. So I, I tend to have about 30 outlines, each one. I think, oh, now I've got it all figured out. And then a week later, I throw it away, and I completely redo it. So it's a very um, continually evolving process. I would say seven or eight months into it, I finally know what the book is about. Uh, and that, that's okay, that's all right. That, every, I think everyone has their own weird process for writing a book. I, I think I heard in an interview that you said that each successive book has taken longer to write. Yeah, I'm getting slower. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with Grunt, I'm, there's a lot of really fabulous stories in there which you should all definitely read. What didn't make it into the book, what, and, and why was it cut? Um, it, isn't, it isn't that it was cut, but there were three chapters <clears throat> that I was going to report, uh, I was going to embed in Afghanistan 
<coughs> to report. Um, I was going to go out. I wanted to embed with the chaplain's corps uh, because I, I wanted that. That would have had that would have been not a PTSD book, but a book about I mean, book chapter, but more about um, how can you. Is there anything you can do just to, to make this less of an emotional burden? And what do the chaplains do? And the chaplains, you know, I wasn't so interested in the religious element of chaplains, but the fact that they go out on, say, uh, um, you know, root clearance, like clearing IEDs from a root, or they, they go along, so they have this uh, ability to, to empathize uh, with soldiers because they are out there risking their lives too. And I, I found them sort of interesting. Uh, so I wanted to do that. I was going to do a medevac story, oh, no, a, a, a chapter, and a blood chapter. So I had three things I, I would have done, um, but the uh, ISAF, which was the coalition organization, because it's a you know it's a coalition. It's not just the U.S. in Afghanistan. So uh, they said, um, I know the army said yes, but we're saying no. Uh, so they turned me down, um, and partly because it was during the drawdown in Afghanistan. There wasn't a, a, thankfully, there wasn't a lot going on in terms of medevacs and and um, blood, and that, so it was the timing was not great for that. But I, those things I would have liked to put in the book, uh, and I didn't because I wasn't I couldn't go. Related to that, this book primarily deals with the U.S. military, yeah. and I, I assume that that was a conscious choice, or did you tell us about that? Well, I tried to cover some things in the Indian military, especially they had a telepathy unit, which I thought was, there was, there was a telepathy experiment that, it, oh, it, it that. was not ongoing, but it, there was a psychological warfare, it's on the website. <laughs> It's, uh, but anyway, that, I thought that sounded quite extraordinary. Um, there were a few things the Indian Defense Ministry had done, and since that was where I started out, that, that's where I got the idea. Uh, but uh, I couldn't get anybody to return email, phone calls, faxes, any, uh, anything. So I got nowhere with the Indian military. <laughs> um, and similarly, uh, attempts to get in touch with somebody in Israel, I wanted to talk to somebody about a particular thing there. Uh, and uh, it, it, it takes, when you're dealing with uh, an organization as, as big and entrenched as the military, you kind of, you, you kind of need to uh, do some legwork in the beginning to kind of get set up. <clears throat> and to do that with the UK or Israel, uh, it was just, it would have been another m months of kind of going through the right channels and getting to the right person and uh, so that, that's partly why. But there were a couple things I thought about covering o overseas. And normally I do try to have some overseas chapters, like in Packing for Mars, I spent time at the Japanese Aerospace uh, Exploration Agency and also uh, Star City in, outside Moscow. Because it, it's just, it's, it's interesting to have a cross-cultural perspective. But in this case, just dealing with the bureaucracy and the permission processes was kind of daunting. Following that, war and the military is obviously, there's a lot of sensitive topics related to that, especially when you're talking about soldiers who are going through reconstructive surgery or, or that sort of thing. Can you talk a little bit about how you mix that with humor? Because your books are very funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah that was something I, I did uh, fret about a fair amount, like how do I make this book a Mary Roach book. People have come to expect a certain amount of humor in my books, uh, but, not, but, but be appropriately respectful and, and serious when it's called for. So one of the things I did, uh, there are a couple historical chapters, chapters which have to do with the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, and there, I had the files from National Archives, the correspondence back and forth. One of them had to do with a stink spray that was developed with, you know, very, just very sober planning and, and experimenting and smelling and, and attempts to deploy it. And there was a lot of backfire and there was, <laughs> there was, it was, it was very comical. Anyway, they were both, and there was a shark repellent chapter also. And these are both, there are little, people are like, why? It was like, they, you kind of went like, went off into World War II. I, I mean, it was a kind of a departure in the middle of the book, but the reason those were there is because they were kind of hilarious. 
And I wanted there to be a little bit of that in the book. But throughout the book, I think the humor is more, it's directed at me being the clueless outsider. Like the, I was at Aberdeen Proving Ground for a chapter where they were, um, they were trying to come up with a crash test dummy for testing vehicles that are driving over sometimes you know, 100 pound IEDs. How do you make a car safe for, that's gonna drive over a bomb like that? And the only way you, you, know, you, you wanna test it the way you test a car, so you have to develop a specific crash test dummy for a blast coming up from below. So they were showing me this vehicle and explaining how it's very stripped down because um, if you think any added weight should go toward being it, making it more protective, so there's no microwave, there's no bathroom on board. It's very stripped down, and I will I go oh, it's great though that you have some cup holders, and the guy goes the guy goes Mary those are rifle holders, <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of thing would just happen a lot. Um, <laughs> Because, yeah, at one point I was, I was uh, at Camp Pendleton at the shooting range, and it, I was handed an M16. And they would say things like, are you a left or a right-handed shooter? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> and you know, they, and I, then they, they're, they're, there's something called a magazine that you put, it, it holds the ammunition. And I've seen on TV where they, you put it in and you smack it with the heel of your hand. And I'm like, I can... <laughs> I got this, I got this. <laughs> so I'm like, S smack, and, he's, and he goes, um, other direction, so the bullets are pointing forward. <laughs> so just like that kind of stuff, um, ha just happened a lot. So that is more the strategy, I guess, uh, if there was a strategy, but it's mostly intuitive. There's just a lot of places where it's, just a, it's not funny, it's nothing, you know, and it, it wouldn't be appropriate. It isn't appropriate. It didn't occur to me to be, try to be funny. Yeah. Speaking of the shark repellent, I have to show this picture. My a couple friends and I read this book for a, a book group a couple uh, last summer when it first came out. And then I went with, to Washington, D.C., to the Air and Space Museum. And it's a little hard to see, but this is shark repellent right there, this thing right here. Shark chaser. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh -huh. And it's in the astronaut survival yeah. equipment. Yes. That's right. Kit. I know. And you know what it is? After they tested every compound known to man on the, in these tanks with these poor sharks, they're like, what? Jesus, another. Yay. Uh, finally, they basically just stole the idea from squids. Is that the plural of squid? Squids? Squid. A squad of squids. A squad of squids. <laughs> anyway, it's just a bunch of black dye. So you would like open it up and kind of like cower in this quickly diluting cloud. <laughs> and, but yet yeah, by the time the shark gets there, like it's just, you know, pale gray. <laughs> You're like, hmm. So that's what's in, that's basically, and they threw in a few other little things that they'd had some, like ammonium something, I don't know, but it's mostly just dye, and the whole idea with Shark Chaser really was just to make, give people kind of a sense of, of um, reassurance, or false, <laughs> false hope, uh, just to, just, no, we'll be okay, we've got our Shark Chaser. <laughs> it seems to me, though, if you want people to not freak out about sharks, don't even remind them. Don't have a little thing that says shark chaser. Because probably they weren't going to focus on shark. They're probably going to be just like, oh my God, not, I'm going to like, die of exposure, cold, heat, whatever. Who's worried about sharks until they see shark chaser? <laughs> but it's cool that they have. But even the, yeah, even the Apollo, the Gemini, Apollo, was it Apollo or Gemini? I can't remember. One of them, yeah. Yeah, I was very pleased when I saw that. I was like, hey, it was in the book. I really wanted to get a sample of Shark Chaser, but I didn't find it on eBay. <laughs> you can find everything on eBay. So one of the topics that you very explicitly mention in the, the uh, intro to the book is PTSD and how you are not talking about that in this book. And I know we've had some talks on the neuroscience of PTSD in the past, and I know that that's an, an important topic to many of you. Can you talk about why you didn't include that? Um, 
yeah, but just for that reason, it's an important topic. It's a huge topic. It's the, the, the topic of entire books. And it, it felt like if you're going to just cover it in a, in a chapter, in a kind of offhand way, um, I, I didn't really kind of fit with the things that I was writing about. And it was also... Um, I couldn't, after the chaplain, the chaplain's corps was essentially, would have been um, a, a, a related uh, subject, uh, but, and when that fell through, I couldn't really find, I remember asking around and there was some, you know, someone said, oh, we're, we're doing, uh, we have some animal assisted therapy and dogs come around, I'm like, I, I don't know. Um, so, um, and there, there I, I did talk to the guy at Walt, um, he's either, no, is at USIS, the Uniform Services, uh, University of Health Sciences, who was looking at concussive um, brain injury, explosions, and the effect of, you know, that kind of concussive injury, and whether that was sort of an organic contributor to PTSD. Um, but it, um, there was, you know, I'm, I'm usually, with every chapter, going somewhere, and there's sort of a scene, and I didn't really have a, um, didn't really have a way in that felt right, and it also just is covered so much. And most of the things in my book are the stuff that kind of falls through the cracks. So speaking of stories that fall through the cracks. I thought you were going to say cracks. <laughs> 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 I could. Um, <laughs> What is your favorite story in this book? Uh, it could be one that it yeah. actually made it into the book or sort of an aside that didn't make it in, but what, what's your favorite? Oh, I'm really fond of the diarrhea chapter. <laughs> I am too, for what it's yeah. worth. It's pretty um, funny. It was, I think this was the, the, I said at the time that it was happening, this was the, the most awkward reporting challenge I've ever had because what I had done here is... Um, I heard about this Navy doctor who was going over, he was testing a, a, a clinical trial of a faster acting regimen for, 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 for diarrhea, you know, specific bacterial infections. And he was doing some testing over in Djibouti at Camp Lemonnier, which is in which North Africa. Djibouti for diarrhea I know. research? I mean, come yeah. on. Djibouti. <laughs> yeah. And so he, um, he was doing the clinical trial, and the, the thing about Camp Lemonnier is there are a lot of uh, special operations units that are leaving from there to go Somalia, Yemen. There's a lot of counterinsurgency work, and a lot of those secret squirrel guys, and they're, they're there, and I thought it's really interesting. Um, the, t the, I wanted to focus on them because they're, the rates of diarrhea among that population are twice as high because they're going out into villages and they're talking with elders and they're having the goat that might not have been refrigerated and the water that hasn't been treated, and they get really bad diarrhea all the time, and then they're going on these missions that they, they can't really, um, there's only usually you know, two or three of them, and they can't stay back, they can't duck off to the side. You basically just have to crap your pants and keep going. And I really wanted to have a conversation, but then I got there and it turns out those guys are off in their own special zone that has a fence and razor wire and it says, we are you know, authorized to kill if you try to come in here with your stupid notebook, Mary Roach. And so the, um, the public affairs guy, we just, he goes, you know, they, they don't have their own chow hall. So he's like, basically, they only come out of there to eat and to steal our women. So, <laughs> so I, um, I had to come up, go up to this rather sort of imposing guy with a big beard who's sitting alone eating a meal. I had to somehow introduce myself, say that I need to talk to this stranger about diarrhea, and he's eating <laughs> at the time, and it, uh, so I'm, I got the public affairs guy to walk over there with me, and I really felt like, you know, like a fifth grader at the dance, like, like this is not going to go well, we're going to be rejected, it's going to be horrible, and, but anyway, um, it, it, it all kind of worked out, he tried to go like, I'm done, I'm leaving, and pick up his tray, and I like got, sort of got in front of him, like, well, I just... Need just to, to, to say, that, um, I'm, I'm an author, I'm working on a book about, well, it doesn't matter, the chapter is about diarrhea, and I know, I know it's sort of a tee-hee topic, and he looked up and he goes, it's not, and you're welcome to sit down. And it was a really interesting conversation that was very awkward to initiate. 
But uh, that was, yeah, I, I think that was just because afterward I was just giddy, like, I did it, I got it. <laughs> uh, and that, that was just one of those little day, reporting days, yeah. Well, didn't he think you were with special... Oh, he, yeah. he, at the end, yes, at the end of it, he apologized for having been so frosty and squirrely, and he goes, yeah, you scared me. I thought you were NCIS. First of all, <laughs> that's Naval Criminal Investigation S Service. Anyway, that, like, and I just love, like, you scared me. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I'm right. And I didn't want to know why he was worried about NCIS <laughs> coming over. You wheedle your way into some interesting places. For example, nuclear submarines, or one, anyway. And you talk a lot about sleep deprivation on that one and just life on the submarine. How the hell did you get on a submarine? And can you talk yeah, about that chapter? Yeah, I just wear people down to a stub. <laughs> I just, I called this guy up, Jerry Lamb, who is the director of research at Naval, the Naval Submarine Medical Research Laboratory. And I told him who I was. It turned out he had read one of my books, which is always key. If somebody gets what you do, and they like the idea of you sh writing about their work. Uh, and that was, that was great, because he said, I like what you do, and we here in the Navy tend to just turn our wagons in a circle and keep people out. And I don't know why we do that, and I'm retiring in a year, so I don't give a shit. <laughs> and a whole year went by, and we tried different strategies. Um, we tried, it was hard because there's not a lot of space for, not a lot of bunk space for women. At that time, there were uh, women in the, uh, the um, officers, but not the, the enlisted, not the um, rank and file. There were no women, so there weren't a lot of spaces to sleep on board. And also, uh, a, a, a ballistic missile submarine, because it, this is a vehicle, this is a roving nuclear arsenal. There are, I forget how many Trident missiles on board this thing. And the whole idea is that it's out at sea. It has, it's nuclear powered, so it can stay down for months. It doesn't need to go get gas. So it just, it, it's out there kind of patrolling and trying to stay hidden. And so you can't just, you know, hitch a ride. You, uh, so in the end, what the opportunity that presented itself, and I just, just I called, I called poor Jerry Lamb every week, like, oh hi, it's checking in, you know, um, and in the end, it was there was a, a group of um, prospective commanding officers who were taking a practical exam out at sea for four days, so I could go on the boat with them. We went out about eight to ten hours uh, into the Atlantic. In the in the morning, the sub pops up, and they kind of lay a plank down, and you walk across and climb down the hole and the submarine takes off. And, and so I was able to, it was kind of the only way to do that. So, uh, and it came in just under the wire. I had to turn the book in like a month later. Um, or maybe even after, a month after the deadline. Anyway, it was, it was I, I just, oh no, that was a different chapter that came in <laughs> after the deadline. This is, this, that's how these books go. Um, but but it, it turned, and it turned out to be really interesting be, because when they have these prospective you know, captains of the submarine, they throw everything at them, including a launch of all missiles, like a simulated launch all missiles, which is really, really nuts. And you, you know, I'd be down there going like, it's, it's like there's a guy kind of like folding up an extension cord while this is going on. I'm like, if this were really Armageddon, do you think he'd be like winding up an extension cord? <laughs> and I couldn't get, they, they were not playing that game. I just. Anyway, another guy had it was blowing his nose, and I'm like, if you had just launched Trident missile, I mean, would he be blowing? Would you blow your nose? I don't know. I just the whole, you know, the juxtaposition of the the mundane and the end of the world, and and you know, Jerry Lamb. Well, it wasn't Jerry Lamb. It was the uh, the, the uh, commander of the sub. He's like, Mary, if your nose is running, you blow it. You know, yeah, he's couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't get him to go there. Nobody would go there with me. I'm like, oh my God, can you imagine launching like one of these, let, like, let alone the whole kit and caboodle? Anyway, and the weird thing with the, cause the, for a sleep deprivation chapter, uh, because it's so crowded on submarines uh, and, and they've had to add more crew over time as these things have gotten more complicated, the best place to sleep is between the missile silos. That's, 
that's the most privacy and it's the most, it's, the, it's quiet and it's so weird. <laughs> what about military food? I've heard that on the submarines, they, they actually get, are given some of the best food in the military. I don't know if that's actually true, but I assume since you were there for four days, you got to try that mm -hmm. and MREs, yeah. I, did, are they any good? Um, you know, um, MREs because MREs have a very long shelf life. They process the hell out of them, so they're they're not they're not delicious. They're not. Um, uh, I've had a uh, and then and they do things like caffeinated meat sticks, <laughs> and that a caffeinated meat stick really kind of tastes exactly like you would think. <laughs> and I was there, and the and the public affairs guy was so excited. I got you a caffeinated meat stick. You know, you said you're interested. Here you go. And I made some sort of face, and he's like, really, you don't like it? I said, no, it's horribly. And he goes, Brian Williams really liked them. <laughs> and I have a footnote that says, or did he? <laughs> Which I like five years from now, people will go, what does she mean? But it was right around the time of the Brian Williams, I was shot down thing, yeah. <laughs> The, the food reminds me of your book, Packing for Mars, where you go into great detail about the, the way the space yeah. program deals with the food that they send sure. up. Can you talk a little bit about Packing for Mars and, and uh, just about yeah, sure. that in general? Well, um, well the, yeah, the food was fascinating because the food for astronauts um, was... It's very highly processed, Not, and in the early days, these were very short missions, so it wasn't so much that they had to have a you know, long shelf life. The reason they were highly processed is that the goal here, since there was no toilet on board and only a bag to shit in, the idea with the food was to constipate the hell out of the astronauts. That was, you know, that was the idea, like give them something that has no... Um, like it's, I think low residue is the term. <laughs> and um, that's, that, was, that was why, that was why, that they wanted to spare them the horrors of the fecal bag, which had a finger caught, which was just like, you, I'm not even going to tell you what you're supposed to do with a finger caught. But, that, but the, that was part of the, and the food was, it was designed by, um, it was developed by veterinarians. So it's basically like astronaut chow. <laughs> Yeah, and it was the, and it was little, and it had to be bite sized because if you bit into the food and, and you're floating around, you're in zero gravity. Uh, crumbs will float off and get into the wiring and you know be annoying, and so they everything was bite sized, like little tiny toast cubes and little just little meat. Everything was really really cute, but nobody wanted to eat it. So it tended to like fly into space and come back down. Yeah. You got to ride on the vomit comet for that yeah. book, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. That are all of you familiar with what the vomit comet is? The parabolic. Yeah. The, it's a. It's a. Yeah. It's a plane. It, it gives you about 22 seconds of of float of zero gravity, um, where because it's it's not in space. It's just a plane that's going like this. And as it goes over and down, you've got 20 some seconds where you're floating. And then when it pulls out to go back up, it's double gravity. So you're like pinned to the ground and you can't pick your, your head now weighs too much for your neck or my neck muscles to not Vin Diesel's or, but mine, <laughs> uh, to pick up. And it was, and, and then, and so people lie down because you're less likely to get sick if you lie down during the pullout. So everybody lies down on the heavy part and then it's kind of like, um, what's that religious thing where everybody's going to... The rapture. The rapture. It's like the rapture. Everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. So it's... And, and there are always, even though they give you really good drugs, uh, um, there's always one... Like poor... LSD or what? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> for, for motion sickness. Okay. Sorry. I wasn't clear. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> LSD, yeah. Wow. Imagine. <laughs> um, they, uh, no, they give you, 
Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, there's always one poor person who gets really sick, and they try to quickly float him over to the back of the plane and strap him in and give him some sort of sedative. And the reason is that if this person does Ralph in microgravity and you're underneath, that stuff now weighs double and it's going to like come down. Yeah. So, yeah, he was, they quickly took him to the back, yeah. So, but it was fabulous because it... It, you, your, it seemed to me that your organs inside you have a, a, a sense, a weight. You know, your heart's kind of hanging off your aorta. Your, your, like stuff's kind of in there with a weight. And then suddenly you're in zero gravity and none of it weighs anything. And so you're, you're, you're suddenly freed of this burden you didn't know that you had. And you're like a, a soap bubble, just floating, and you can be Superman. And it's, it's just awesome. You can do this commercially now. Uh, there's, there's flights. Yeah, zero gravity core, I think. I think it, it costs about the same as a you know, first class plane ticket. It's not that much money. And it's really worth it. <laughs> Although I did it free at NASA by pretending to be a journalist. <laughs> your book, Stiff, is the first one of yours that I read. Um, I imagine some of you it was the first one you read. And, yeah. Um, Thank you. And I know that there's at least one person somewhere over there, um, specifically, and, and I would imagine a number of you who are very interested in dead people um, <laughs> or dead things. Uh, why did you write that book? <laughs> What's no, and, wrong with you? Yeah, right? Uh, no, can you talk a little bit about that and, and yeah, what inspired yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. No, I, um, uh, at the time that I began that project, or just before, I was writing a column for Salon.com. Remember Salon.com, the first internet magazine. <laughs> Very exciting. 1999. Uh, I was, so I'm writing a, a, sort of a regular recurring column in a way, but a reported column about medicine, health, human body, but my kinds of topics. So there were, uh, there were uh, three cadaver research related topics. One was uh, a Thanksgiving week piece about how much the human stomach will hold before it bursts. <laughs> and someone in the 1800s, a German guy I believe, uh, uh, had done a cadaver experiment, which actually makes zero sense because if you eat a lot and to the point where your stomach is stretching to the point where it might burst, you, have, you will reflexively vomit. But if you're a dead person, those reflexes won't work. So uh, it, didn't, it didn't really make sense to use cadavers, but it was a charming study because he sat them at a table. They, he sat, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if they had a napkin here or, not, like he set the table, but he, they, they were sitting up and he, you know, put, filled them this way. But I, so I, uh, there was that, <laughs> there was that column. And um, another one that had to do with how they calibrate crash test dummies using cadavers. And an agent had contacted me around that time, who is still my agent to this day, and said, you know, do you ever think about books? And I went, Psh, no. And I, he said, you know, you should think about it. And why don't he said, what, which ones of your, which of your columns have the highest hit rates? Because this was the internet, and you could check that. And your editors would do that all the time. They'd say, you know what? Only seven people clicked on that last one, which is very demoralizing. Anyway, but the cadaver column seemed to be popular. And he said, why don't you write a, a proposal? Which struck me as a terrible idea. I couldn't imagine the scenario whereby somebody would go into a bookstore and like, there's a whole table of new releases and amazing books and like who's going to be the person who goes, this book about cadavers, that's what I'm going to read. Like what? I made no sense to me and I, I, I had a lot of fear and uh, insecurities going into that publishing of that book. I thought it was going to be a disaster. Well, it wasn't. No, no, it turned out okay. <laughs> And I think one of the books that, well, perhaps one you're most infamous for is Bonk, because of the taboo topic of the curious science of sex. 
how it, you talked about how you decided that you were going to do that one. Um, did you have to sell anybody on that idea or was it like, oh, hell yeah, we're going to do a book on sex? Oh, hell yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went to dinner with my agent and my editor in New York and I'm like, sex research? And they're like, good, yeah. All right, let's order some appetizers. <laughs> that was it. And, and Gulp, you talked about the alimentary canal, so from your nose, actually, right, all the way through yeah. back to the anus, because, you know, yeah. why not? Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yeah. And you got through. to stick your hand in a cow, right, in the oh, side. Oh, yes, a fistulated cow. Yeah, no, it's, 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 a, um, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, those, if you have those, what's that called when you've, you've got an earring? The that's plugs? A plug, a plug. It's kind of a, a, a plug in, in the side of the cow that he heals over, and there's a little um, kind of like a, a, like a gas cap, kind of. <laughs> and you can put your, um, you can put your, it's the rumen, and you can put your arm all, all the way down, and it's, the cow's just sort of eating and ignoring you, and it's, um, it, it's not painful to the cow it must be very strange for the cow these people come up and but anyway you can uh feel the and because because a, a cow's stomach operates differently the, the rumen it's a it's a fermenter it's bacterial breakdown and it, it's hot in there it's like a compost heap in there it's hot and it's also churning it's like an industrial machine it's really something and so um you yeah. have a glove on, right? Like a shoulder you, you glove have, or something? Yeah, you do. You have a s shoulder glove. And I showed up I, at, at the farm. It was at UC Davis. And I, because when I'm going on an interview, or I try to kind of look presentable. And so I'm wearing like a skirt and kitten heels. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like walking through cow shit. And, and like, and there are flies everywhere. And, and everyone was looking at me like, what, what's wrong with you? Uh, but anyway, yeah, to answer your question, yes. <laughs> I, I imagine that you get a lot of people looking at you like, what, what's wrong with, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. And that's totally a compliment because I love your books, so they, they work out really well. Um, so what's next? I don't know. I don't know. I, there were a couple of, I've gone down a couple of roads and backed out. Um, I, I think that you know, kind of the, the obvious Mary Roach topics, I and mean, there are only so many taboos that kind of vaguely relate to the human body. Oh, so we I, can help you come up with yeah, some, no, I'm let's, sure. I know. Let's crowdsource my next book. I, no, really, I think uh, uh, we should do that. But I I'm don't, sure you no, get that I offer a lot. I don't know. I don't know. And I, I, you know, maybe it's time to completely change direction. I, I, I kind of would love to have more of a through line to fall, like have characters that go all through a book rather than different characters in each chapter. And, uh, but I don't see the world through those goggles, so I'm always just kind of seeing the world the way I see it. Uh, and, and so maybe somebody needs to help me. <laughs> Well, I think we all love the way you write and have loved your books. And for those of you who are not aware, you probably saw it on the way in. We do have Broadway books here who, who has copies, a few copies left of Grunt, as well as a bunch of her earlier books. So if you are interested at the end, uh, we will, you'll be able to purchase some books and Mary will sign them for you as well. Also, I have oh, a right. special. Okay, this is so special. Um, um, I uh, have this, this is a little giveaway for people who, people who buy books. Uh, this is a, an actual toilet paper packet from an MRE. <laughs> As it turns out, they're made about 10 minutes from my home. They're made in San Leandro in California. So I ordered, the minimum order was 2,000. And um, I had stickers made that say grunt, <laughs> which I thought was lovely and appropriate. And so, um, I'm handing these suckers out. <laughs> so get online and take them away, yeah. Yeah, when I was trying to do promotion for this event, I kept trying to write a title of come see, or come grunt with Mary Roach. I'm like, no, that doesn't quite work. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That so it'd be a regional thing, grunt. I'm from New England, and people would say, oh, I gotta go take a grunt. Is that, is that it? Did you say that out here? Okay, all right. So the whole joke missed an entire segment of the country. 
But now you know, because I've explained it to you. So I think what we'll do is we'll take some questions from the audience, sure. if you're good with that. So if we can sure, get the sure. lights up for the, the audience, that'd be great. And Rita, my minion, she's over here. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Hi. Hi. Um, it's kind of a mundane question, but all of your books seem to have single word titles, except uh -huh. for Packing for Mars. Is there a reason behind that, or? A reason behind Packing for Mars? Yes. Or the, yeah. Packing for Mars. We failed. <laughs> <laughs> we tried so hard. It had to be a word. I mean, I, it doesn't have, there's nothing in my contract that says one syllable title, nothing else will be allowed. I mean, there's, it, it just, we fell into the habit. We had stiff and then spook, and now you've got two, and that's a collection. So, uh, so that, it just sort of became a habit. And then Packing for Mars, ah, what? Launch. It needs to be like, end in like a K or a P or a, you know, launch, yeah. It just didn't have that zing to it, you know? There, we, there wasn't anything. So we failed, we just failed. It was, you have no idea the, the fretting and struggling that went on between my publisher, my agent, me going, void? Orbit? No, I don't know. Yeah. You gotta go void now? What? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we, yeah, we just failed. <laughs> Where are you reading? Oh, you're over there. Mary, I'm kind of curious. What books you read? Oh, um, I, I, read, I read fiction and uh, nonfiction. I just read Dave Egger's new one, Heroes of the Frontier, which I loved. Um, I just read Bel Canto, which everybody else read years ago. Um, I love Bill Bryson and Susan Orlean, and I love Bill, Burke Bilger from The New Yorker. I haven't seen anything by him in, in a while. Um, and, uh, gosh, I, so many. David Sedaris. I haven't read the, the Diaries. I don't, has anybody read that? Yeah? Is it, is it as good as the others? It does. It's different. It's different. Um, anyway, uh, so, yeah, fiction, nonfiction, yeah. Not that many science writers, though. I'm not, not you, you know, I should read more of them. <laughs> I tend to bog down a little bit. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question about how you, uh, how you structure your books, because when I'm reading them, they seem very, like, kind of follow random tangents. I um, fooled you. <laughs> and yet they're very, very clear and easy to follow, and I wonder how you pull that off. Ah, oh, thanks. I, um, I'm, I'm always wondering if I do pull it off. Um, you know what it is? Um, lots of times it's just, uh, you got to just, toward the end of the chapter, think of, like, what, what, would be a way to set up the fall. Like, there's some logic that will, you know, like one chapter kind of sets up the next one, and then and that one sets up the next one. So it leads people to think that there's a flow when really, like, it's just from one chapter to the next. But the overall order is a, is actually secretly kind of random. Um, sometimes, like packing for Mars, there were certain things I wanted up front. Certain things need to be explained early on. Um, but, it, but and, and invariably, my editor will go, like, you can't lead with penis transplants. <laughs> That's not going to be the first chapter. No, 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 no. Uh, so I have to, like, pull that out and shove it in somewhere else. And <laughs> I didn't even mean to say that. I do this all the time. That's horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> Somebody's going to tweet that, and I'm going to be fired for... <laughs> Anyway, uh, so, and I, init I always go, I can't possibly, but like for Gulp, Gulp was nose to tail, and she's like, my, she, she didn't like the first chapter, and she goes, why don't you take, I don't know, something below the waist, uh, and I'm like, I can't pull the ass and put it up, <laughs> it goes from here to here, I can't just yank the rectum out and put it up in the head, so. Uh, Some people do that all the time. Other, pe other people. <laughs> Yeah, other people. The other people do that. Uh, but so I had to go and report an entire uh, an, an extra chapter to give her what she wanted. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a little bit random. It's just kind of like you know you, you setting up what's coming at the end of a chapter. It's it's all just 
chewing gum and what's the other thing? <laughs> Duct tape. <laughs> Piano wire. Exactly. Hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, we've discussed a few times how controversial and taboo your topics can be. Have you experienced any backlash? Um, one book in particular? Uh, what kinds? That mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, you know, no, because I'll tell you why. I think that the titles, the covers, everything about the book is kind of self-selecting for a certain kind of reader. I don't think people pick up a book called Stiff and expect it to be a moving book about someone's final days. It's not, I mean, I think that, I think that um, it self-selects for the right kind of reader, is my sense. Um, so if I get, and the other thing about um, negative feedback, people happily, when people read a book and they choose to write to an author, it's usually because they like a book. If they don't like it, they kind of just throw it away and go, oh, I hate that book. And they trash you on Amazon, but I don't read it. I don't read Amazon. <laughs> I don't go there. So, um, so no, I didn't really, I didn't really, I didn't get backlash. I, I don't know where I would have expected it. Maybe from, you know, Bonk. You know, I, I know that Kinsey, uh, Kinsey has a lot of people who feel like he invented homosexuality and they're very angry. Yeah, uh, they, like, he's at, like a flashpoint for certain family values groups. And um, they kind of like tried to block the biopic from being released in movie theaters. There's a lot, there's a lot of crazy Kinsey stuff that goes. So I thought maybe I would get some of that, but I don't even think I'm on there, those people's radar, <laughs> thankfully. Okay, you mentioned that you had gone down some paths for possible books and ruled them out. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could maybe tell us about one or two of those. Oh gosh, sure. I was. I, there were a bunch of them that were sort of for two days. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. No, it's terrible. Um, I thought about. I thought about skin as a topic. I've thought about um, like meat, flesh, kind of something in that realm. I thought about natural disasters, and that one logistically was too hard to set up. Kind of the human elements of that. Uh, what else? I, they, those are the those are the most recent ones that I've kind of backed out of. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in the introduction to Bonk that your goal was to not embarrass your stepdaughters. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What does your family think of the topics that you have and the <laughs> books you have to collect to do research? Yeah, um, that was my goal. You're right. I, and, and here's what happened. My stepdaughter, Lily, hadn't read a book of mine in, in, yet, and she goes, S the sex one. I'm going to read this one. This one I'm going to read. <laughs> And then she heard about um, the scene with her dad. <laughs> and she went, Ew. <laughs> And I'm like, I'll just tear those pages out. It's only two pages. You don't have to read it. No, but no. <laughs> so, um, and my, for Bonk, I was in Miami, and my in-laws live in South Florida, and they all came to the bookstore, and... Um, I remember, t I told the, the story that I shared with you about the ultrasound machine, and they were there in the audience, and I just tried to position myself so that other people's heads were completely <laughs> blocking them. <laughs> and then afterwards, um, I, they, they left and went back to their house, and I went to my hotel, which was somewhere else, and I asked my husband, like, what did they say? And what, how did they react? And he said, not a word was spoken. <laughs> <laughs> They just never, that my, my father-in-law, well, well, his line was, he, he, they'd always get a copy of the book, and they were proud in their way, but he'd say things like, I read every word. <laughs> yeah, but did you like any of those words? <laughs> I read every, like it was this chore. <laughs> I don't know. They're, but they're lovely. They're lovely people, and they would never want to hurt my feelings, but I think they think I'm really warped. Hi, um, someone kind of stole my question about backlash, but I've actually experienced backlash from your book, I guess. <laughs> You've experienced backlash? I have. After, oh, re no. after reading Stiff, I was like, I am gonna, I was a 
organ donor, but I'm like, I'm going to be a body donor. Like I'm going to yeah. go change my driver's license. And I went in and the woman at the DMV was very adamant about pushing brochures to me. Like, think about this. <laughs> really? <laughs> you like, should have given really? her a copy of Stiff. Uh, after she changed my license, I wrote down Stiff, Powell's Books, Mary Roach, and I gave her <laughs> <them> the <this. laughs> All right. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, that's so Thank you. I You're love that. Welcome. And then a second part, I, th I was thinking you were like, oh, book ideas. I'm like, have you ever thought about combining things like maybe bonk and grunt? Like you take the sex scene with your husband and you put it on the no gravity plane. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I tried, actually. I, I, thought of, I thought about that. Like, yeah. Well, but anyway. You had a, a chapter with that in pack, Packing for Mars, didn't you? There's a, yes, there's a zero gravity sexual intercourse chapter. I am not featured, though, in that. Sadly, in that chapter, yeah, so. Was it in your book that I read that the use of duct tape and zero Gs? Yes, yeah, would yes be one of the astronauts was saying, why are we like, what is all the big fuss about, like, you'd need special, like, he's like, just a roll of duct tape, come on. So you're this wonderful blend of normal, but also liking things that are a little off center. Yeah. And when did you realize you had that trait? How did it develop? <laughs> uh, um, I, you know, I, I, people ask me like, were you a really weird child? And I, for many, for a long time, I said, no, I was a really normal child. And then I had a couple memories of uh, one in particular, when I was in first grade, I was given, I, don't, I didn't like dolls, I liked dinosaurs, horses, whatever. Anyway, someone gave me a Barbie doll and I was like, what do you do with this? So what I did was I would pull the head off and I would say, you have five seconds to get the head back on or she dies. <laughs> and, and guess what, that's actually accurate. If you could reattach a head that quickly, probably be okay. But I guess maybe, I don't know. I, so I, I didn't know it, I didn't realize it, I didn't recognize at the time that that was weird, but um, looking back, maybe it was. I don't know. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, I maybe haven't fully even absorbed it now. <laughs> well, because you were a journalist for years yeah, before yeah. you, and I would imagine that, well, you've already talked about some of your stories that were a little off kilter. Yeah. Right. So are you, I guess that's just, these books are just following in the theme of that, yeah, right? right, right. So yeah. how did you develop that? I don't that, know. Or do I, you know? Just, I just, I guess, have a, a, um, an unusual curiosity and, and maybe not the same kind of filter in, in terms of asking people questions. Like, I, I don't know, I would, I remember being in an operating room for the first time and it was a story, again, for Vogue magazine. It's hilarious. I wrote for Vogue. <laughs> Uh, and the surgeon, it was a, he was a plastic surgeon, and, and he was using a laser, and it, it, there's a you know cook, cooked meat kind of smell. And I said, do you find that smell enjoyable? I didn't think that was a weird <laughs> question at all. And he's like, that's kind of morbid. <laughs> I don't know. So I don't know. I, um, I, he, yeah, I don't remember what he said, although I, I, a similar thing happened with Grunt, and it was... Uh, it wasn't the same question, but the surgeon shared that when you cut into the prostate, a lovely smell is released. I, I don't know. I, we, didn't, we, we did know prostate cutting that day. So I, don't, I can't personally vouch for the lovely smell. But um, anyway, uh, the thing is that, that usually when, you, when you're talking to somebody who's, this is their day-to-day -day job, whether it's cutting open a prostate or um, being a deaner and, and segmenting bodies, it's just, it's just your normal, so people are, they talk about it like I might talk about changing the garbage bag liner. I don't know, it's just, it's just, a, daily, it's just a mundane thing. So it's not, like the, the topics don't really have a kind of an awkwardness or a charge to them, because it's, it's just, that's what the person does for a living. So anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. Good evening. Hi. Um, one of the things you said uh, 15 minutes ago was that your books don't have this connecting narrative. Right. You don't have a common character. To me, clearly, you are the connecting character, the things that you get yeah. connected with. And 
I understand that, you know, oh, a topic grabs me, uh, whatever. Yeah. Oh, that one, it really grabbed me. Um, you're both, you get connected to an idea, but the other thing that I've seen is you get connected to telling stories. Mm-hmm. Have you ever considered writing a book? I realize this is kind of meta, but about what moves you, what stories move? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that could be a book, but, but um, I think I, I'm the least interesting thing in my books, you know? My, I don't know. I don't, think, I don't think I'm that, I don't, like, who cares? What, uh, yeah. But anyway, thank you. <laughs> Which of your books, uh, after you found out all the things you found out about the topic, which of your books changed you or surprised you or blew you away? Um, I think they all kind of affect me in relatively, not profound ways, but they do, um, it's more the little things, like for Gulp, um, I spent some time at this place in the Netherlands where they study um, oral processing, which is how you chew f- and, and f- swallow. And you would, I learned all this stuff about like intraoral bolus rolling, like how you, you take a bite of food and you take it apart in your mouth and then you reconstruct it in the form of a bolus and you put it into the swallowable state, which I have a footnote that that should be Rhode Island's <laughs> license <laughs> plate. <laughs> um, the swallowable state. Um, but that, and, and that affected me just, I mean, I know this isn't what you're getting at, but I, like, I would, after coming back from there, I would go to a restaurant and I would look around at people chewing and I'd think, I can't believe people do this in public. It's disgusting. <laughs> people should have, people should have sex in public and chew in private. <laughs> so uh, I gain these weird perspectives and, and they, they, they fade with time. I'm okay now. I can go to a restaurant and not be disgusted. But myself, too, I was like, oh, it's like I'm making a bolus now. Oh. Uh, uh, so it's more that kind of thing rather than any sort of profound. Um, I mean, it, it, they're always, I always, I just love coming away with just this new knowledge of a whole world that I didn't even know existed. It's kind of a wonderful privilege. Yeah. We'll do a couple more questions. Have you ever started exploring a topic and just been like, nope, this is too gross for me? Huh? No. <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I intern in a cadaver lab every summer. So ah. thank you for that. For yeah. Stiff, it's recommended reading for anyone who interns there. Um, All right. My question is, have you ever kind of ventured into a topic and asked a person in the scientific community that you are entering in, and they've been like, nope, heard of you. Like, <laughs> you Oh, <laughs> I always anticipate, I, after Stiff came out, I, I, I thought that things would, it would get harder to do these books because people would go like, oh, I know what you do. Whew. Stay away. Um, but uh, in fact, it's actually gotten easier uh, on people. I mean, there, there will always be emails that don't get answered. And you have to wonder, is that because you know what I do? Or is that because you don't read your email? Or, and, I, and I'll send two or three emails to some. And, they, and if I don't get a reply, I don't know if that's why. I don't know if that's what it is. Um, but I'm always kind of pleasantly surprised when somebody like Jerry Lamb, the, the guy at the Navy lab, like, yeah, I, I like what you do, and, and let's, let's bring you over here. I'm always kind of like, really? <laughs> you know what? You're, and you know, I always, I, I, I send a copy of one of my previous books to anybody I'm going to go visit, because I don't want anybody to feel surprised or taken advantage of, or like, what? I thought you were writing a textbook. I don't, I don't want that. I want them to know what, frankly, what they're in for. <laughs> and so, um, so I, so I, I no, I haven't had a problem with that. Thank you for not making me get out of the aisle. Um, hi, um, 
I haven't read your books yet, but my mom is a huge fan, so I'll be reading them all. Um, <laughs> Thank have you, you, Mom. Have you? <laughs> she's. You awesome. have some very enjoyable reading ahead of you. <laughs> I was like, Mom, Mary Roach is coming. We got to go. Um, have you thought about doing a book about like women, just and calling it femme or something, and covering pregnancy and women's processes? Um, that's very taboo. That's a yeah. That's a, <laughs> actually that's a good. That, yeah, I never thought of women. I've, people have suggested um, birth and pregnancy, but there have been a bunch of good kind of history of and science of birth and pregnancy. So I, I felt a little bit um, like like there 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 is that that has been covered, but I, like expanding it to w women. That's kind of interesting because the the question when Packing for Mars came out. The question I go asked most often, okay, five times maybe, but it was um, people wanted to know about menstruation and zero gravity. And, and, and because most astro female astronauts, they go on the pill or they use tampons, uh, so it, it's, there, it, nobody's done research on what if you used a sanitary napkin, would it even come out? Which is the question I had. And frankly, when I was interviewing Commander Peggy Whitson, I couldn't find a way into that. <laughs> I had like 10 minutes with her on the phone in a little booth at Johnson Space Center and I, and I just couldn't seg way, seg into, segways the scooter, right? I couldn't seg into it and so I failed my readers and they're like, hey, why didn't you ask about menstruation and zero gravity? But anyway, yeah, uh, some, I do know somebody's actually actively working on a book about menstruation specifically. But I think it's a good idea. I remember. Chick. <laughs> I remember it's got the something final from, K. Yeah. yeah, right. From Packing for Mars about one of the early female astronauts, and they were asking her about products. Oh yeah. Oh, the one. Yes, there was a there was a an astronaut. Was it Sally Ride? Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she opens her, and they'd all been tied together like sausages. <laughs> And they came floating out. She's, this is what a two, like it wasn't, it was, if it was the shuttle, it was a two week mission. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a long time. But they were like, yeah, like 100 tampons. And she's like, a man packed this bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you were talking about the, uh, the laser surgery and it smelling like barbecue or something and it reminded me of when I was in massage school in the cadaver lab and I'm looking at this and I'm going that's meat and you can't say that <laughs> but uh, unless unless you're me exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I'm comfortable with you know that's me that's not a, a person anymore yes. but um and and it made me think if I were more ambitious I'd shut up and write it myself but uh rub because just off the top of my head you've got uh, yeah, the relaxation and the, you know, maybe health benefits and emotional benefits thereof. The fact that just, I've had clients who came to me every week just because no one else in their life touched them. Yes, that's interesting. And then yeah. there's the, the real sciencey massage therapist that will take like people who can't walk and right. like perform miracles. Yeah. And then there's the, <laughs> so your massage therapist, you do topless massage. To which I replied, yes, you'll have to take your shirt off, but, <laughs> but I'm saying, <laughs> yeah. rub, I, that, yeah, there, rub, there's one, it's yours. <laughs> rub, I like it. Uh, let's do Grub, one. the follow-up. Yeah. Let's do one Stub. more question. Stub, no. Yeah. Flub. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So um, back onto the topic of women, um, I think what would be interesting, especially with your style, is something that channeled more into non-binary women and non-gender conforming women. Because there is a lot of work on mar women in marriage, women in pregnancy, women who follow all the natural ways women are funneled in our society, but there's not a whole lot on women who don't. And I think it'd be really interesting um, to, to see that come from somebody like you who keeps yeah. it real and keeps it humorous. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think that I think you're right. I think that could be a really interesting book. I feel like it's very, it's political in the way that like I'm gonna, I'm gonna just like say the wrong thing or use the wrong term or offend. I don't know. I'm gonna screw up. 
with that one, I think. I don't know, and I also feel like it's maybe a book better written from somebody who's living it, you know, like Jenny Flynn Boylan, who wrote those amazing memoirs. Yeah, I, I love, I read both of those memoirs, and I, I, don't, I don't know, I feel a little bit like a trespasser, I don't know. But, so, well, yeah. I, I have one more question, and that segues, not the scooter, but that, <laughs> that segues nicely. So you're not a scientist, you're a journalist. Shh. Right. <laughs> and, and I am not necessarily comparing myself to you, but I'm not a scientist either. I run events and I, I, I play a scientist on stage. Uh, how do you walk that line? Do you ever get people who you're interviewing who call you out on that or do they care or can you talk no, about that? No, people are, uh, scientists are incredibly, at least to my face anyway, incredibly, who knows what they say when I leave. Can you believe she didn't know what a who huh is? Um, but they're incredibly patient and really generous with their time and willing to, and I have no, I have no shame. I'm, I'm willing to say, you know, you hold, like, stop. We need to rewind and you need to talk to me like you're talking to a seventh grade. Like, just really dial it back because I need to understand it thoroughly so I can explain it to people who have the same background as me and so I'm really sorry to do this to you but can we just like set aside your current work that you're very interested in and it is fascinating I'm sure can we <laughs> just talk about the basics that you learned you know when you were an undergraduate I don't just um, but there's and they're so patient and and generous I can only think of one instance where a researcher just wouldn't do that just wouldn't do it and was annoyed and I just uh, called the editor and said we can't I can't I don't know what he's talking about I can't do the story <laughs> well I think that that is one of the reasons why your books are so fun to read is because I I'm assuming most of you don't know have any special knowledge about the topics that you're discussing yeah it's an advantage and a disadvantage it's an advantage in that you never have to worry about am I leaving people behind because I'm getting too technical I don't worry about that so much um, but it does mean that I, I am always a little bit on thin ice like am I gonna am I gonna say write something that just shows that I don't know what I'm talking about like I kind of get this sliver but I don't have the context of having studied biochemistry I don't have the big picture and so while it's accurate line by line anybody who's in that field will be like yeah but you left that part out or so it's it's both good and bad yeah well, I think it's good. Well, thank you. And I'm guessing that most of you think it's good as well. And let's say thank you to Mary Roach. Oh. And thank you to all of you for coming this evening. As I mentioned, we uh, Mary will be in the lobby signing books. I have to and, pee first, though. So okay, yeah. So we'll it'll it'll be well, you know, beer. Um, so please. Uh, Take a look at those books. And at, just as a reminder, speaking of beer, the next event that we will have will be on Thursday, July 6th, talking about the evolution under the influence. And fill oh, out. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, please fill out your evaluations and you can give them to the minions as you head out. And thank you all for coming. Have a great evening. Thank you. Hey, so thanks for sticking with us. Uh, that was fun. And hey, what uh, theaters? Everyone unmasked. It was a little disconcerting to, to watch, but um, I had a good time. I hope you did too. And just wanted to give a quick plug for our next event will be on Thursday, January 20, um, talking about what insects do and why with Dr. Ross Piper, who is an author, entomologist, zoologist, and explorer. Should be a fun event. And then just one more quick plug for uh, if you are interested in helping us do live events that are both in person and streaming um, we would be incredibly grateful for your tax deductible donation um, to our uh, campaign so thank you all for coming this evening thanks for watching and um, we hope that we can do this in person sometime soon so have a good evening <laughs>